All right, here we go, gentlemen. We are now going to start some screencasts of Hamlet. Okay, this is in our Norton. Uh, one thing, so we're gonna, this screencast will be act one, scene one. Please like these videos on YouTube and uh, subscribe. Um, we'll be doing act one here and scene one. And what I'd like to uh, highlight for you is the overall mood that this scene generates. And there's gonna be two things I emphasize. Um, one is just the general eeriness of the situation. Um, and the second thing is the repeated questioning. Um, we'll notice, you know, with, with Shakespeare, it's, it's very, I think, valuable to, um, to think about what voice the verbs take. Um, for example, kings and queens almost always speak in the imperative. They give commands. Um, and one thing that's very distinctive about this opening scene is the prevalence of the interrogative. There is a lot of questioning going on. And I think it highlights the way in which this play is really a play about trying to gain knowledge, um, trying to answer questions, um, trying to overcome skepticism. You know, many would argue that this play, and I, I, I'm going to maintain this as well, that this play is a precursor to the existential movement precisely because it reckons with these crises of meaning, value, and identity. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to pay attention to that as we go through scene one here. And we notice right away the very first words of this play, who's there? Notice... <laughs> I want to unpack that a little bit. Not only is it a question, but it's a question about identity, right? Who is there? Um, who am I looking at? Who is presenting themselves to me? Um, this becomes an even bigger question as various characters in the play start to deceive each other and pretend to be other than who they are. Who is there? Uh, another question, Bernardo. Further down, Bernardo asks, have you had quiet guard? So already in our first 10 lines, um, three of them have been questions, okay? Um, what we're at here is a changing of the shift and uh, a changing of the guard watch. And so now Horatio, who is not a guard, but um, uh, comes in. And again, we hear the who is there. Okay, who's there? Is Horatio there? Um, so we're getting these, these repeated questions, okay? Now we start asking, now the eeriness starts to emerge. And again, in the form of another question, has this thing appeared again tonight? Okay, um, and now we learn that they've brought Horatio here to see this thing that they saw last night. So already we're wondering, what did they see on their watch um, last night? And as they're talking about it, the ghost enters. And Marcellus, Bernardo, and Horatio all see this ghost. And they all say it's the same figure like the king that's dead. It looks exactly like the king that's dead. Okay, so right now, we've also gotten some key information here, which is that there is a dead king here in Denmark, okay? Um, and that this ghost resembles him. All right, now another question, looks he not like the king, market Horatio, and uh, Horatio responds with fear and wonder, right? Um, so, uh, so now they speak to it, and it's Horatio who takes the role of speaking to it. And they ask him, Horatio asks him, What art thou that you surface this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes mark march? By heaven I charge thee, speak. So look at what he's asked there. He's asked, What are you that usurps this time of night? So what are you that sort of overtakes this time of night? Um, 
and you do it together with that fair and warlike form of the dead king. Okay, so, and it walks away from him, and then it finally exits. All right, um, and now the, the three men here unpack. What is it that we just saw? Is not this something more than fantasy, right? Didn't we just see something real? What think you on it? So look at the questions here. What do you think about this? What did we just see? Was this real? Um, is it not like the king? Okay. Um, and Horatio says in between there that if it hadn't been for seeing it with his own eyes, he wouldn't have believed it. Okay. Um, all right. So now they, uh, they continue on um, and they give us a little bit more background here about the former king. Okay. So they say that the last king, the one who just appeared before us, um, was, was challenged by this Fortinbras, king of Norway. So we've got a Denmark-Norway um, battle. And they were, the Fortinbras dared what we now learn is King Hamlet to combat. Okay? And in this combat, Hamlet slayed Fortinbras, and they had a sealed compact, what we'd call a contract. Um, and this contract meant that whoever, if Fortinbras lost, which he did, he would forfeit with his life all his lands which he stood seized of um, to the conqueror, okay? Um, and so uh, this was something that they had agreed to, and now that um, Hamlet won, that he would get all of Fortinbras's, um, all of Fortinbras's land here, okay? Um, and so um, we are now in a state, though, that that king the triumphant King Hamlet is dead, and so uh, we need to see if that, you know, if that agreement between Fortinbras and Hamlet still obtains, okay? Um, all right, so now we go on, and uh, Horatio, notice Horatio is a very philosophical thinker. He's much like Hamlet, the, the young Hamlet who we'll meet. He gives a lot of classical allusions here. He alludes to the day Julius fell, um, in Rome, um, right, which is a uh, certainly a uh, evocation of one of the most famous betrayals in human history, the betrayal of um, of Julius Caesar. Okay, um, and so now let's look at what we've learned so far. We've learned about this appearance of the ghost, and we've now learned about a battle between Fortinbras and Hamlet, um, which Hamlet won. And, uh, and that also we've learned, of course, that King Hamlet is dead, okay?